All right, here we are again, another class on Numbers and Deuteronomy for beginners, faithfulness in the face of challenge. This is lesson number six, and the title of this lesson is Preparing to Enter the Promised Land, and hopefully we will cover chapters 28 to 36 of uh, the book of Numbers. Well, in this uh, final lesson covering, uh, as I said, chapters 28 to 36 of Numbers, we go full circle in the journey of the Israelites to the Promised Land. After their departure from Egypt, they made their way to Mount Sinai, where they spent nearly two years in preparation for their journey uh, to the land of Canaan. We witnessed their departure and eventual plan to spy out the land in preparation to enter, remove the inhabitants, and settle the land as their own. In our previous session, we read about the failure of the spies to bring a good report, which caused a rebellion among the people and God's judgment upon them in the form of a curse that they would remain in the wilderness until every single person of that generation, except Caleb and uh, Joshua, that refused to enter in would remain and die in the wilderness. Now, the irony of this punishment was that it would be their children who they had used as an excuse not to enter in. They said, oh, we can't, we can't enter in. It's too dangerous for our children. We want to protect our children. Well, in the end, it would be their children uh, who would come into the promised land and not their parents. So far, we have seen the passing of the older generation of leaders as Aaron and Miriam have died and Moses will not advance with the people into Canaan and has asked God to transfer his authority over to Joshua, who will be the one who will not only lead the people into the, uh, into the land, but also lead them in the conquering, apportioning and settling of the 12 tribes in the land given to them by God. So the people are once again amassed across the river, ready to cross in, but unlike last time, there's no scouting and there's no reporting, only the real time preparation of the people to go in and take, with God's help of course, the land promised to them long ago. So in chapters 28 to 36 of the book of Numbers, um, these chapters contain a mix of regulations for offerings, uh, preparations for entering Canaan and guidelines for the distribution and governance of the promised land itself. These chapters effectively transition the narrative from the wilderness wanderings to the threshold of Canaan and then setting the stage for their conquest and eventual settlement of the land. So we begin with chapters 28 and 29, instructions for daily offerings and uh, festivals. And so uh, Moses gives the people um, the uh, information uh, for their worship system. Uh, and um, uh, he uh, provides them with the daily and regularly, uh, regular offerings. Uh, for example, there'd be a morning offering and an evening offering. Each morning, each evening, two lambs, one year old without blemish as a burnt offering each day. And then they would have uh, the Sabbath offering every Sabbath, in addition to the daily offerings, two additional lambs of the same specification for the burnt offering with accompanying grain and drink offerings. And then in addition to these, there was the monthly offering at the beginning of each month, the new moon, if you will. Uh, here, two young bulls, one ram, seven male lambs, uh, one year old without defect with associated grain and drink offerings, plus one male goat for uh, sin offering, read about that in chapter 28, 11 to 15. So those are the daily and regular offerings uh, to be uh, accomplished each day, each month, each week, and so on and so forth. Then you had the annual festivals uh, that um, uh, they had to uh, keep. First was the Passover, that was in the first month on the 14th day. Uh, special sacrifices were associated with uh, Passover, the remembrance uh, meal, remembering the time that they, uh, left, um, they left Egypt. Uh, second uh, feast uh, was the days of unleavened bread. Again, the first month, this time from the 15th 
to the 21st day. Here, two bulls, one ram, seven lambs, one year old without defect, each day of the festival as a burnt offering with appropriate grain and drink offerings and one goat uh, for a sin offering every single day uh, for the uh, festival of unleavened bread. Then there was the Feast of Weeks. Uh, we're more familiar with the term Pentecost. Uh, this uh, uh, took place 50 days after the Passover, seven weeks, you know, seven Sabbaths plus a day, 50 days uh, after uh, Passover. It was a single day festival. Uh, and on that day, two young bulls, one ram, seven one-year-old lambs, again, without defect for burnt offerings uh, with accompanying grain and drink offerings. And as always, uh, a goat for a uh, sin offering. The uh, fourth feast mentioned uh, in the uh, calendar is the Feast of Trumpets on the seventh month, the first day. Here, one young bull, one ram, seven one-year-old lambs without defect for burnt offerings. Again, associated grain and drink offerings and one goat uh, for a sin offering. That was for the Feast of Trumpets. The next feast was the Day of Atonement. Again, the seventh month, this time on the 10th day. Uh, and the offerings were one bull, one ram, seven one-year-old lambs without defect for burnt offerings, grain and drink offerings accompanying these, and one goat for a sin offering. The next feast was the Feast of Tabernacle, uh, or some, some call it the Feast of Booths. Uh, again, the seventh month, uh, this would last from the 15th of the seventh month to the 21st day of the seventh month. Um, numbers of bulls uh, decreased each day. In other words, they began with a certain number. They began from, with 13 bulls and each day they decreased one down to seven, uh, while one ram and seven lambs were constant daily offerings all with the corresponding grain and drink offerings and also a goat for a sin offering. Now, by the time of Jesus, uh, three other feasts were added to the yearly calendar. Uh, the seventh was the eighth day uh, of assembly. Uh, this was uh, in uh, the, the month of Tishri on the 23rd. Uh, this was the day after uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a separate festival immediately following the Feast of Tabernacles marked by a time of assembly and prayer. And it served as a closing to the intense series of holy days that they had uh, experienced. Then there was uh, the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah. Um, it was on, in the month of Kislev on the 25th. Uh, and this corresponds, of course, to our months of November, December. Uh, although of later origin and not one of the pilgrim festivals, Hanukkah commemorates the rededication of the second temple in Jerusalem and is marked by the lighting of candles each night for eight nights. And then there's the Feast of Lots or Purim, uh, the, the, the Jewish month, Adar, the 14th, again, uh, usually occurs uh, in winter, February to March. This feast marks the deliverance of the Jewish people from imminent doom at the hands of the uh, uh, Persian official uh, Haman, as recorded in the book of Esther. It is a festive celebration involving the reading of the book of Esther, the giving of gifts, uh, and uh, various uh, charitable donations. Now, I've included in your uh, student workbooks, those of you, some of you are watching this and taking your own notes. Others uh, have uh, ordered the uh, student workbook. Uh, and in the student workbook, you have a Jewish uh, calendar the f of the festivals uh, as they were in AD 30. And what we've done is we've matched these to the Gregorian calendar. So we have the Jewish calendar, the dates when all of these feasts would take place. And then we also have the Gregorian calendar, which is what we use today to give uh, you an idea of what time of year these feasts took place. And we also provide uh, some of the information that I've just given you about what took place 
uh, during uh, each of these uh, feasts. So this is your kind of go-to uh, reference. Uh, when you read about one of these feasts, if you don't remember exactly, you can go straight to this uh, calendar here and uh, get a little background information. All right, another event and tradition popular with the Jews, but not, rego not recorded in the Hebrew Bible um, is the uh, history of uh, the Maccabean revolt and um, uh, especially uh, the uh, event of the miracle of the oil. You hear about this all the time. I thought I'd uh, add this right here uh, to give you uh, some background on these two uh, events. First of all, after successful guerrilla war against the Seleucid Empire um, in 167 BC, the uh, Jewish family of the Maccabees who led this uprising recaptured Jerusalem and set about rededicating the temple. Upon recapturing the temple, the Maccabees sought to relight the menorah, you know, the uh, sacred uh, candelabrum, uh, an important ritual that symbolized the presence of God in the sanctuary. However, they found only a single cruise of pure olive oil that had not been defiled by the Greeks. Uh, bearing the seal of the high priest. And so this small amount of oil was sufficient, but only for one day. According to tradition, the oil miraculously burned for eight days, which was the time needed to prepare and to consecrate fresh oil under conditions of ritual purity. Uh, these detailed instructions for daily worship and yearly festivals reinforced the importance of regular and seasoned worship as the Israelites prepared to settle in Canaan, ensuring that the community remained in constant communion with God. So there's just a little background history on a tradition that you might hear uh, people talk about uh, that is not necessarily uh, written about in the uh, Hebrew Bible uh, in the Old Testament uh, anywhere. So we'll continue now with our uh, study um, and we'll move on to chapter 30. And in chapter 30, you have a regulation of vows, uh, chapter 31 to 16. These were laws concerning the making and the fulfillment of vows, particularly focusing on the vows made by women and how they were to be handled by their fathers or their husbands. In the end, the men who were charged with the leadership of their families would be bound to uphold and support the completion of the vow. And so for this reason, they had a say in the making of a vow by the woman in the family. The system also tested the involvement of the men in the affairs of their own families, since there were instances when their authority could be nullified. For example, failure to object promptly. If a father uh, hears his daughter's vow and he does not express disapproval on the day that he learns of it, the vow stood and the daughter was obligated to fulfill it. Similarly, if a husband uh, hears of his wife's vow and does not make an objection on the day that he hears it, the vow remains in effect. So uh, Romans, uh, not Romans, but Numbers rather, chapter 30, verse uh, four to seven. Another law concerning inconsistency in response. Here's an example. If a husband initially approves or fails to disapprove his wife's vow, but then later decides to annul it, the vow cannot be nullified after the initial period of acceptance. The husband therefore is held accountable for any resulting iniquity due to his inconsistency or failure to annul the vow uh, promptly. And then uh, we also have another, uh, another law, and this is uh, for those who were widowed or divorced. If a woman who made a vow subsequently becomes a widow or gets divorced, her vows or her self-imposed obligations stand, regardless of whether her husband had previously objected. This is because his authority to nullify her vows ends with the dissolution of the marriage. 
So these rules uh, serve to regulate the making and fulfillment of vows, emphasizing the importance of accountability and the integrity of one's word within the community. Not everything was uh, done with lawyers, uh, contracts, things like that. Uh, your, your word was your vow, your word was your seal. And these rules here uh, made sure that uh, uh, when you had given your word, you had made uh, an obligation. We move on to chapter 31, and in chapter 31, there's information about the war against uh, the Midianites. The destruction of the Midianites, as uh, recounted in Numbers chapter 31, has several reasons rooted in the narrative of the previous chapters of the book of Numbers, particularly the, in, the incidents involving the seduction of Israelite men by Midianite women and the subsequent idolatrous worship of Baal Peor. So here are some of the reasons behind this action. First, a retribution for the incident at Peor. Uh, the primary reason for the conflict with Midian was their role in purposefully leading the Israelites into uh, idolatry at uh, Baal Peor. In Numbers 25, we know that Midianite women under the counsel of Balaam seduced Israelite men and invited them to participate in the worship of their God, Baal Peor. This led to a severe plague from God that killed 24,000 Israelites as divine punishment for their idolatry. Also the divine command for vengeance in Numbers 31 verses one and two, God specifically commands Moses to take vengeance against the Midianites for their role in that Peor uh, incident. This divine directive is portrayed as a punitive action against the Midianites for their successful plot to curse Israel through indirect means after Balaam could not curse them uh, directly. Also, it prevented future idolatry. The, the drastic measures taken against the Midianites can also be seen as an attempt to remove a persistent source of idolatrous influence that was always near Israel. This was crucial as Israel prepared to settle in Canaan where they would constantly face temptations to adopt pagan practices from their very close neighbors. Um, the action against Midian was part of preparing Israel to enter the promised land by purging them from the sinful influences that had led them astray previously. And so this cleansing was not only physical, but it was also spiritual, uh, emphasizing the need for holiness and fidelity to God. It was also a demonstration of divine justice. You know, the severity of the response to Midian reflects the biblical theme of divine justice. I mean, those uh, who lead God's people into sin face harsh consequences, which serves uh, as a warning to both Israel and to the surrounding nations. Uh, by carrying out God's command against Midian, Moses reaffirms Israel's special covenant relationship with God, which demanded exclusive loyalty and obedience to him and to him only. And perhaps one more reason, political and social implications. Uh, from a socio-political perspective, defeating Midian might have also served to enhance Israel's position among the local powers, uh, demonstrating their might and God's backing. This would be significant in establishing Israel's place in the geopolitics of the uh, Canaan uh, area. Uh, they would be taken seriously by uh, other nations once they witnessed the power of the Israelites uh, against uh, Midian. We go to chapter 32 and 33, and we have a, a settlement and a review. In chapter uh, 32, uh, there is the settlement of the Transjordan tribes. Um, the tribes of Reuben and Gad, uh, we read in chapter 32, they request to settle in the fertile lands of Gilead and Bashan east of the Jordan River because of their, live, uh, their large livestock herds. And we see that in the map. We see uh, in the blue there Gad and, and in the yellow 
uh, Rubin. Now this arrangement, which includes their commitment to help conquer the land west of the Jordan River, illustrates themes of you know, negotiation, responsibility, and the importance of unity in achieving common goals. Uh, here, uh, before, all the tribes were thought to uh, take land on the uh, uh, western, excuse me, on the western side, yes, of uh, the Jordan. Uh, but it seemed that the land was better suited for these two tribes uh, on the western side. And you'll, when you read this, or if you've already read it, you see that they negotiate the terms for uh, settling that particular land, something that they, uh, something that they didn't have to do uh, while they were wandering in the uh, wilderness. In chapter uh, 33, Moses reviews the stages of the Israelites journey from their departure from Egypt to their arrival at the plains of Moab by the Jordan River near Jericho. This uh, retrospective is significant and it serves two primary objectives. First, it documents and legitimizes the Israelite uh, journey. Um, the detailed account serves as an official record of the Israelites' movements through the wilderness. This documentation is crucial, not only for historical purposes, but also for future generations to have a concrete account of the fulfillment of God's promises and guidance. You know, God freed them from uh, Egyptian slavery, but what if there was no record of the wilderness wanderings and the things that happened and how God took care of them and their failures and their success? If there was no record, uh, then there would be a, uh, you know, a hole in the history there. There would be a blank in the history of the people, how they got to be where they were and how they got to be who they, who they were. So very important. By listing each location where they camped, Moses provided a clear and structured itinerary that highlights the progress and the challenges that they faced uh, along the way. And of course, the review underscores the reality that each stage of the journey was made under divine direction. The text often notes that their encampments and travels were commanded by God reinforcing the idea that the journey, despite all the difficulties and the length of the journey, was part of a divine plan. This affirmation served to legitimize the leadership and the path taken, reinforcing the faith of the people in God's ongoing provision and protection. In other words, the journey was not their idea. The journey was God's idea. Freeing them, they, they, they're not the ones that ask God, free us from Egyptian slavery. God is the one that said, I'm here to free you from <laughs> Egyptian slavery. Uh, it's not the people who said, well, we're going to take this direction, then we're going to go here, we're going to go there. No, God is the one that led them through the wilderness. Every stop, every turn uh, was guided by God and uh, communicated to the community uh, to, uh, by, uh, by Moses. And so now we're at the uh, preparation uh, to enter the promised land. Reviewing the journey allowed the Israelites to reflect on their past experiences, the lessons learned, the miracles witnessed. This reflection was essential for preparing them spiritually and mentally to enter the promised land. You see, understanding their history was crucial for ensuring that past mistakes were not repeated, especially those that led to divine displeasure and punishment. They knew from experience that uh, disobeying God um, brought consequences, but they also knew that obeying God and certainly being faithful to God brought uh, blessings. And so as the Israelites stood on the brink of achieving the goals set forth by their ancestors and promised by God, reviewing their journey served to renew their commitment to the covenant with God. It reminded them of their unique relationship with God and their obligations under the covenant, which would be critical as they transitioned, as I mentioned before, from a nomadic existence to settling in the land of Canaan. And so the recounting of the journey in Numbers 33, thus serves as both a historical recapitulation and as a spiritual preparation. 
It, it consolidates the narrative of the exodus and wilderness wanderings while setting the stage for the conquest and the settlement of Canaan, ensuring that the Israelites remember and draw strength from their journey under God's guidance. And so this chapter not only contextualizes their experiences, but also reinforces their identity as God's chosen people, tasked with fulfilling a divine mandate in the land that was uh, promised to them uh, and promised uh, rather to their uh, forefathers. Again, uh, it reminded them that all of this was not their idea, it was God's idea. In chapter 34, uh, we, we move on to more mundane things, in other words, uh, geographic things, you know, the boundaries, uh, the geographical boundaries of the uh, uh, promised land. Um, the land boundaries in chapter 34, uh, we have a precise geographical boundaries for the allocation of Canaan among the uh, tribes. Uh, this is just a very general map that you see here. This was the land of Canaan. Uh, it wasn't uh, any further north and it wasn't any further south. It couldn't go any further west because of the sea and it didn't go any further east. These, you know, in, in, in chapter 34, we, 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 uh, we, uh, we get or we see uh, the boundaries of the land uh, in general. And so this established clear guidelines for the division of the land, underscoring the importance of orderly distribution and management of God-given resources. They didn't just, you know, God just didn't turn them loose and say, sure, go in there and just grab as much as you can, no matter what. No, it was a very specific land mass that they were uh, to uh, divide. Also, there was a division of the land among the tribes. The land uh, was to be divided by lot among the nine and a half tribes, because if you remember, uh, Reuben, uh, Reuben rather, Gad and half of the tribe of Manasseh have already received their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River. We saw that before. This method ensures that the division is seen as directed by God's providence. And so specific leaders, this is what they did, specific leaders from each tribe are appointed to oversee the distribution of the land, the distribution of the land rather. These leaders, one chief from each tribe, are responsible for managing the allocation process and ensuring that the boundaries for each tribe are respected. And as you read this material in chapter 34, you see that it's very specific as far as the boundaries are concerned. You know, it goes along the river, it goes through this mountain, it stops at this point, it picks up again over here. So the boundaries of the land are, are well traced and you see the results of that in the uh, map that uh, is up on the screen uh, at the moment. Uh, the idea that specific leaders from each tribe are appointed to oversee the distribution of the land, a chief from each tribe guaranteed uh, consistency and continuity as uh, the tribes uh, divided the land. Also, the significance of all of this was that the detailed boundaries and the use of lots for division signify a methodical and divinely guided process aiming to ensure that each tribe received a fair portion of land. What does that mean, a fair uh, portion of land? Well, it meant that they had enough land to support the number of people uh, that they had in their tribe. And so the clear demarcation of boundaries helped prevent disputes over land, and it also established a structured setup for the newly formed Israeli uh, nation in the promised homeland. So uh, these guidelines not only facilitated the practical aspects of settling a nomadic people into a, a permanent homeland, but it also reinforced the importance of divine guidance and fairness in the distribution process, underscoring the covenant relationship between God and the Israelites. This was all part of the covenant, the promise that God made, I'm going to give you land, and now the land is being apportioned to each tribe. Remember, these people you know, were slaves in a land which was not their own. In chapter 35, uh, there are the details given concerning the Levitical cities. 
and the cities of refuge. And so chapter 35 provides specific guidelines for distributing the promised land among the tribes of Israel, focusing particularly on the allocation of cities and surrounding lands to the Levites, as well as the establishment of cities of refuge. So here is a brief summary of these uh, guidelines. First of all, there was the designation of the Levitical cities. Since the Levites were not given a distinct tribal territory like the other tribes, they were to receive 48 cities spread throughout the different tribal territories. This distribution ensured the Levites were present uh, across the land so that they could fulfill their duties in religious instruction and temple service for everyone you know, uh, in the uh, promised land. Also, each Levitical city was to be surrounded by pasture lands uh, extending outward a thousand cubits, it says, which is about you know, 500 yards uh, from the city walls. The pasture lands were intended for their own livestock and their crops and their uh, other needs. Next, uh, we find out about cities of refuge. Six of the 48 Levitical cities were designed as cities of refuge. These cities provided asylum for individuals who had committed manslaughter unintentionally, protecting them from the avenger of blood until a fair trial could be conducted. Remember, no police force, no army. Uh, if there was a crime, especially a crime of murder, there had to be a way to have justice. And so uh, one person in the family of the individual who had been killed was tasked with uh, uh, you know, uh, meeting justice uh, towards the individual who had killed uh, their family member. On the individual side who had done the killing, uh, he could go or she uh, could go to uh, one of the cities of refuge, uh, which would guarantee a fair trial where they would listen uh, to the uh, various uh, details uh, of, the, uh, of the case. Uh, the cities of refuge, uh, they were strategically chosen to be accessible to all Israelites. This placement ensured that everyone and anyone uh, who needed to flee to a city of refuge could reach one without do, uh, undue hardship. Now, once inside the city of refuge, the accused had to remain there until the death of the current high priest. After the high priest's death, they could return to their original home without fear of uh, retribution. There were additional uh, laws concerning uh, manslaughter. Uh, the manslayer uh, was required to stand trial before the community to determine the intent behind the killing. This trial ensured that the protection of the city of refuge was granted only in cases of unintentional killing. Uh, if the manslayer left the city of refuge before the death of the high priest, the avenger of blood could lawfully kill the offender without any consequences. And so these guidelines in Numbers 35 not only facilitated the fair distribution of land and responsibilities among the Israelites, but it also reflected a complex understanding of justice, sanctuary, and community life. They underscored the importance of the Levites in religious and social governance, while the cities of refuge represented a, a sophisticated uh, legal principle for that time uh, of asylum and protection for individuals awaiting trial, ensuring the maintenance of justice and mercy in a community with no formal public security or criminal legal system. We, we look at this and we say, boy, that's pretty primitive and so on and so forth, but realize they were unique in having this system. No other nation had this kind of, uh, of system that would extend uh, you know, uh, justice uh, to an individual uh, in both instances, to the individual who had done the killing, uh, perhaps by accident, and uh, to those who had lost a loved one uh, they could expect uh, justice of some, uh, of some kind. And then finally, we go to the last uh, chapter in the book of Numbers. And uh, in the last chapter, 
uh, we talk about uh, inheritance uh, laws, um, uh, regulations here uh, ensuring that the inheritance of land remained within an original tribe, responding to concerns raised by the inheritance rights granted to Zelophehad's uh, daughters. Um, uh, the significance of this is that it addresses issues of property rights and in inheritance, ensuring stable land ownership and the preservation of tribal identities within Israel. You know, if there were no sons, uh, then the daughters, uh, there was a mechanism, a legal mechanism, where the daughters could then inherit the land and importantly, keep that land within, uh, the, uh, within the tribe. And so these chapters end the story of the Jews' entrance into the Holy Land on a rather, I would say, low key event. However, these rules collectively set the groundwork for Israel's life in Canaan, transitioning, as I said, from the nomadic existence in the wilderness, which the people would never return to, to a settled and structured community in the promised land, which was the happy ending that all of them had hoped for. These laws reflect a maturation of Israel's national identity, and they underscore the importance of adherence to God's laws as the foundation for national well-being and of course, continued uh, divine blessings. And so for the final time in this uh, particular series uh, on numbers, we will take a look at uh, some lessons that perhaps uh, apply to us as Christian believers uh, today. Lesson number one, structured worship and obedience are basic. Structured worship and obedience are basic. In chapters 28 and 29, uh, th these meticulously detail the daily, weekly, monthly, and annual offerings that the Israelites are to present to God. We see that these instructions emphasize the importance of regular worship and strict adherence to God's commands as a way of sustaining a relationship with Him. This is not just a, an Old Testament thing. We need to be carefully following the instructions given to us about biblical worship today, just as they followed these types of instructions back then. We have to realize that God still requires that we both worship and obey Him in order to maintain a relationship with Him. That idea has not changed, it's still the same. Another lesson that comes from this, social justice and community responsibility are marks of those who are faithful followers today of Christ and in that time of uh, Jehovah. Uh, Numbers 35 discusses the establishment of cities of refuge where individuals accused of manslaughter could seek asylum until they received a fair trial. This, this provision ensured that justice was balanced with mercy, protecting individuals from revenge and punishment until there was a due process, uh, until a due process of law was, uh, was observed. This highlights the importance of building fair systems within societies that protect the rights of all individuals, emphasizing that justice should be tempered with mercy. You know that justice should be tempered with mercy. This is a Christian thing. It, again, it's not a thing that was in the old, just in the Old Testament. It's a Christian thing. It's not a pagan thing. It's a Christian thing. And then one lesson here, uh, one other lesson, disobedience has consequences and faithfulness has rewards, always. Throughout the book of Numbers, the Israelites faced numerous challenges and punishments, often as a direct, consequences, uh, direct consequence rather, of their disobedience and complaints against God and Moses. For example, the rebellion of Korah, where the ground literally opened up and swallowed the rebels alive, not to mention the spies negative report that led to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. However, whenever the Israelites obeyed God, in other words, with their offerings or the bronze snake, they experienced his protection 
and his provision. This overarching theme teaches us that actions have consequences, that uh, uh, faithfulness can lead to blessings. It encourages personal accountability and faithfulness in adhering to moral principles and ethical standards. In a broader sense, it speaks to the need for persistence in righteous behavior, despite the challenges or the delays in seeing positive outcomes. We want to, too many people just want to change the world. They want to save the world. And we don't save the world you know, collectively in, in, in one shot. Uh, we save souls, one soul at a time. It's slow, methodical work. Uh, that's why it requires patience and uh, perseverance. In the end, God always keeps his promises for punishment or for rewards. So let's do our best to obey his word and remain faithful until the end because we too will enter the place that he has promised for us. One more scripture to read. And it's in John chapter 14, verses two and three. Jesus says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is the promise for us. This is our promised land. And our wilderness wandering is the life that we live in this unbelieving world. We arrive at this land here by finishing our land, our, our, our travels rather, uh, and our journeys, um, uh, continuing to be faithful to God uh, in spirit uh, and, in, and in truth. So I pray that you will cling to this promise here and pursue this promise each day uh, with zeal, uh, with faith and with, uh, with confidence. So God bless you, thank you very much uh, for sticking with us as we have uh, worked our way through the book of Numbers. Now, if you're still wanting to continue, we're going to uh, begin uh, the book of Deuteronomy in this uh, series next time. And as preparation for that, I encourage you to read chapters one to four in that book uh, to be prepared for that uh, lesson. Thank you very much for your attention and we'll see you next time, Lord willing.